Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Trailhead. Uh, my name is Steve Baines, and this is a 9.30 session. Uh, you are an architect, you just don't know it yet. First things first, I know the keynote is at 10. This is supposed to run for 20 minutes. I'm gonna do my best to wrap it up about five minutes early so everybody can get upstairs. So don't feel like you have to rush out of here. This is only meant to be a 20 minute presentation anyways. I will also tell you that when I agreed to do this, they told me it was gonna be in front of 20 people. So there's a little bit more than that, but that's okay. I can live with that. All right, so first things first, just a uh, couple questions. Who here would consider themselves to be an admin? Who would consider themselves to be a developer? All right, any admin developers in the room? Okay, who would call themselves an architect? Not many of us, I see one or two hands. Okay, that's good, that's perfect. Now what you all don't realize is that everybody else who didn't consider themselves to be an architect, you actually are an architect and I'm gonna tell you why. So let me just start with this quick introduction about myself. Uh, I'm CEO of a Salesforce partner called Forcivity. We're based in uh, New Hampshire. Yes, New Hampshire is in the United States. I often ask, get people ask me if that's near uh, Ireland or Canada. We are actually near Canada. Uh, I'm a Salesforce MVP. Uh, I'm also a Salesforce certified technical architect. Uh, received that last year out of Atlanta. Uh, shameless plug, I'm a co-organizer for Northeast Dreamin', which is one of the uh, user group Dreamin' events that we have in Manchester, New Hampshire. This will be our second annual. And I'm also the host of CTA Office Hours, which you can find on the uh, success community. So, first things first, for those of you who have seen me present before, I like to use images and memes. I'm actually a huge Seinfeld fan. Um, and for those of you who have seen Seinfeld before, you will realize that George Costanza constantly referred to himself as an architect. So this was his fake job. He would walk around and then try to impress people. He'd say, well, I'm an architect. And you know, that was his way of trying to make himself feel important. Uh, you know, if you know Seinfeld, it was really about uh, him trying to impress women. Uh, but that's, you know, you get my point. Really what it is is there's, there's kind of this pedestal that you know, architects are important. They have this really strong technical ability and a certain type of experience. Anybody seen the new, uh, the new pyramid? I just got this last night. So this is a newer version of the uh, certification period, uh, pyramid. And you can see, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, up along the left-hand side is the application architect track. That's focused on more declarative type of functionality. Each one of those certifications are called designer, uh, designer domains, app builder, um, data architecture, you know, the things that you can do declaratively without code. On the right-hand side is the system architect track. That's more technically focused. Integration, uh, development, identity, very, very challenging. Now, most of you would look at this and say, well, I don't really have a need for those. Uh, even though I do these things in my, you know, my day-to-day -day work, I really don't have a desire to be a system architect. I don't have the need. I don't have the time. But what I'm here to tell you is that regardless of where you are on this certification track, if you're anywhere at all, you are still are an architect. Now, the thing about architects is we're business-minded. We think about the solutions that we're being asked to provide and how do they solve a problem for a business. Technically adept, sure, we know things about Salesforce. Salesforce has such a wide breadth of things you can do in it, both declaratively and through code. We all have some degree of technical aptitude that we can apply to a solution. And we're jacks and jills of all types of trades. So you, know, you may be an expert in flow or an expert in uh, building lightning components. It could be anything across the board. You could be an expert in Pardot. Just because you don't have that, uh, that full pyramid of certifications does not mean that you aren't architected. So, and because of this, I mean, you may master some things in with Salesforce and you may know it across the board. But the thing to keep in mind is you don't need to be a developer to be an architect. That is the very common misconception that in order for me to be a Salesforce architect, I have to be able to code. I have to be a developer. And I'm going to tell you that that is farthest from the truth. And guess what? The project size doesn't matter. Big or small or medium, you are still architecting. Now, I came from the plumbing and heating wholesale industry. So my clients have often heard me use analogies about toilets and pipe and valves, because that's the industry that I 
grew up in, and I know. This is a short little commercial made from Kohler. Everybody heard of Kohler? Make toilets and faucets and things like that. It's literally 30 seconds. Uh, but I want you to uh, just kind of listen to it real quick, and I'm going to talk about it. In this a is second. a classical design we did in Milan. This is a postmodern residence this in This design Eastern. won five prestigious awards. Shaki headquarters in Kyoto. To see our architecture, you don't look around the corner, you look around the world. So, what can I do for you? Design a house around this. Okay, you know what I would call that? Requirements gathering. That's what that was right there. So the customer gave one little thing, said, design a house around this. And that's the look he gave her. Uh, she gave the architect, by the way, too. Now us, as analysts and architects and solution architects, what do we do? We look back and we're like, are you kidding me? That's all you're gonna give me? You want me to do what? You haven't given me any information at all. So. This is where we start to architect. So let's talk about the word architect. Architect is two things. It's a noun and it's a verb. Now notice that I have, I am an architect. Because there are two ways that you can look at this. You can say, I'm an architect. You can also say, I architect. So as a noun, it's a person who's responsible for inventing, realizing a particular idea or project. Who does that? Who does that today in their jobs? Who comes with ide ideas or makes a project happen or makes a, realizes an idea? I think we all do that to some degree. And as a verb, you design or you make. Who designs things? Who builds flows in here? Who builds workflows? You're designing those. Who writes code? You're making things. So see, we're all architects to some degree here. So, the key thing about being a business-minded architect, notice I said business-minded, not technical-minded. It's about knowing how to do something versus knowing what to do. Now, there's a big difference in that. So I'll use an analogy of building a building. Now, does the architect necessarily know how to put all that iron in and the uh, HVAC? Of course not. You can't possibly know all that. You, as Salesforce architects, can't possibly know everything about Salesforce, but you can specialize in thir certain things. And if you know enough to at least design the approach about this is how we should go about doing this, that's about knowing what to do versus knowing how to do something. You can say, well, I need to create an integration with my ERP system. You just architect it. Do you have to know how to do that? Absolutely not. The key thing about being an architect is knowing how to talk. How do you communicate with your constituents, with your customers? And then, how do you get them to talk to you? That is one of the biggest challenges that we as architects have, is how do we extract meaningful information from them in order to design a solution for them? Easier said than done. You know, I have a saying all the time that customers tell us what they want, and then we tell them what they need. And part of that is getting them to communicate to us effectively. So they may say that they need one thing, but they really mean something else. So let's kind of get into traditional architect mode here. So this is what architects proverbially do. And this is what I've referred to as the 5D approach. And I'm going to talk about the fourth D for, uh, in a minute. But we discover. We go out and we talk to our stakeholders. And they say, can you do this? And you ask lots of questions. They give you pie in the sky. They ask you to do things that you, you know, would need 10 people for. And then what you do is you define for them what you're going to do. You tell them, say, listen, you've come to me. You've asked me for certain things. I'm now going to turn around and give you a solution which I think is going to work for you. And that's where your business-minded approach says, okay, you've asked me to do this, but should we do this? Or should we do this a different way? And then once you have agreement, then you design. We all design to a certain degree. It can be something very simple and declarative. It can be something very sophisticated, like a massive integration or a huge uh, Apex project. It can be across the board. Now the fourth D, this is where people get hung up, is you develop it. And that's where people say, okay, I'm out. I'm not a developer, so I'm not an architect. The beautiful thing about being an architect, though, again, you don't have to know how to do everything. The guy who designs the building doesn't know how to do everything, so what does he do? He hands off those blueprints to somebody else, and somebody else builds it. So there's a notion that you've got to 
you know, you've got to be able to do everything within Salesforce to be an architect. And again, I'm here to tell you that that is far from the truth. And then last, you deploy. You know, you can deploy things ad hoc or you can deploy them continuously, but the whole idea is you've just created a solution from end to end as an architect. Now, if you remember back to that previous slide, the size of the project doesn't matter. It can be a micro solution. This is something that could transpire in a couple days. This is something that could transpire over a series of weeks or months or years. So the size of the engagement is, is far less important than what you're actually doing. And for those of you who are actually are on the journey to CTA or pr you're preparing for some type of certification, this is a key mindset to get into. It's how do you think like an architect? How do you think like a designer? It's less about being able to check the boxes and knowing these particular technical skills. It's really about, okay, how do I think through this problem? Uh, anybody in here actually preparing to be a CTA, thinking about becoming a CTA? A few of you. When you re reach the CTA review board, there is a huge focus on your communication ability and being business-minded and thinking about solving business problems with multiple solutions. It's not just coming up with something technical and saying, boom, there, I solved it for you. So when you create these solutions, again, the, so the size of the solution doesn't matter. They've got to do four things. They've got to be robust, meaning they've got to work. They've got to be functional. So your clients say, I needed to do X, Y, and Z. So you want to design a solution that does X, Y, and Z. It needs to be reliable. It has to work. Obviously, it has to work. I'm stating the obvious. But it's something that your customers need to be able to count on, or that integration needs to be, count on, uh, be able to count on. It's got to have some type of retry mechanism. And what I mean by retry is, what happens if something goes wrong? What if there's a failure? What if there's some type of error? What if it's a permanent error? What if it's a temporary error, like somebody's credentials have expired? Uh, like, you know, the credentials that are connecting Pardot to Salesforce. How do you handle that? Now, of course, somebody else built that, so they've built some retry mechanisms, me mechanisms into that. But when you're designing solutions, you've got to think about ways that you can have some type of retry in there. Things that you've got to uh, put in so it fails gracefully, so users don't get a big uh, error message on their UI. So you've got to think about retry. And then it's got to be replicatable. It means it's got to be something that you can do over and over again. As you know, Salesforce supports lots of records, very large data volumes. So when you're designing solutions, you've got to think about that and say, how can I build something so it can be used over and over and over again and not break down? So that's kind of the Salesforce you know, kind of focus type of thing, the technical approach, building Salesforce solutions. I'm going to bring you over to the other side of the coin and talk about what architects actually do. So we've all heard about people, process, and technologies. That, you know, that's really what makes up a project. Um, this chart is uh, actually not mine. It's, uh, I took it from a friend of mine who actually let me use it. And he said to me, he said, if you kind of drew a project out in a pie chart or even a long line, and you have to focus on the people and the process and the technologies to get that project done, you'll find that you spend a very small amount of time in the technology. Salesforce has made it so easy for us. Once you have the solution, it's very easy to sit down and code or build that declarative solution. It's nuts and bolts. You can knock it out. The biggest challenge you have, though, is with the process, and an even bigger challenge is with the people, taking them through those changes. Change management is huge. So what are some of the things that we do as architects? What do we have to do to get people through this process? We have to guess. Sometimes the solutions are not apparent. So we have to be mind readers a little bit. We have to extract like a dentist, get, getting people to talk. So it's understanding those questions to ask. And I've heard many times where I've seen consultants come in and the business user says, you know what, that guy just knew the right questions to ask. Or you know, she clearly has done this before because she knew the problems I had before I even came in here. So she nailed it. She knew exactly the questions to ask me. Sometimes you've got to coerce people a little bit. It's like, listen, this is the right thing to do, so come on board with everybody else. Nicely, of course. Uh, sometimes you've got to play corporate therapist. So change management is hard for people. So you've got to take them through this. And there's lots of ways that you can do that. Um, you can sit there and you can counsel them. You can help them understand the change. Um, you, know, you can show them. You can give them hands-on training. Um, but sometimes you have to console them, too. I've had people crying in my office because of changes that we're going through. So it runs the gamut. We as architects have many things to do. 
and mainly, we are facilitators. It's our job to make things happen. So, and lastly, one more, sorry, and then we have to defend our solutions as well. So as we come up with designs, we have to present them to people and say, this is what our approach is going to be, and defend it, just like you're defending the thesis. All right, so, who's done all of those things? We've all done those things to some degree. See, you guys were all architects. You just didn't know it. So going back to the original definition of an architect, we work with ideas and we work on projects. We make things and we design things. We invent things and then we realize them. We make them come to fruition. So when you all go back to work tomorrow or next week, you can all say, you're an architect and you're an architect and you're an architect. It's time for the keynote. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great day.